have um, Griffin Morris here. He will be the presenter of the event and he is a registered architect. Thank you for uh, giving your time and doing this for us, Griffin. No problem. Before we get started, I just want to mention a few AIA events that we have coming, coming up. Um, so there's a new member breakfast coming up on September 23rd. So if anyone on this event today is a new member, make sure to join. Um, you will meet your board, the EIA Miami board, and um, get to ask questions if you have any. We have the YAF, the Young Architects Forum office crawl with uh, MC Harry and Associates on September 24th. And we also have the town hall on September 30th on sea level rise. So if anybody is interested to join, I will put the link in the chat of all our events. And last but not least, we also have the AI Miami Design Awards event on October 3rd. So without any further ado, I think Griffin, you can get started um, and start the session. I'm still ad admitting a few people just so you know, but the floor is yours. Oh, and before, uh, if anybody has any questions throughout the presentation that Griffin is giving, please write it in the chat and we will make sure to answer you as we go. All right, so welcome everybody. Um, congratulations on being part of this. This is always a, a big step for young associate architects to take getting ready for the ARE. Um, I wanna start everybody off with some words of encouragement. It's possible to do all of them. It's possible to do all of them quickly if that's your goal. Um, I passed mine in about six months total and that was back under the ARE 4.0. So you can do them at a speed of about one per month. You can also take longer. I'm sure everybody knows about the five-year rolling clock. Um, the first thing we're gonna do today is I'll put a presentation up on the screen and we'll go through uh, 12 sample questions one by one. I'll let you guys write down your answers. Um, if you haven't taken any AREs yet, keep in mind that it's always better to guess than to leave a question blank. So I encourage you Take your best guess on all of the questions and uh, all right, let's get started. So I'm going to present my screen. And in a moment, you guys should see a big screen that says say, sample exam part two. So this is part of a series of presentations that we developed for AIA for Lauderdale. And we are on slide 211 of that presentation. Uh, it goes through all of the important parts of the things you need to know for Division 03 programming and analysis. It's meant to be more of an overview than an uh, in-depth study guide. It is based on the Ballast books, which if you have them, make sure you have one that has a little orange stripe on this top corner. Uh, if you have one that doesn't have that orange stripe, you have one that's from their first edition, which has some errors in it that we've caught as we've been studying and using this over the past couple of years. So I'm gonna swing on back to slide 210, set this back to presentation mode. This says everything that I already said. We're gonna look through each of the questions, give you guys a shot to uh, take the sample exam, and then we'll go back and review the correct answers and how we arrive at them. So question number one. A small one-story building in a temperate climate has been designed with its long side oriented south. If a southern view is not a concern, the best passive solar heating method will be A, a direct gain space, B, a tram wall, C, a greenhouse, or D, a convective loop. All right. So write down your answer for that. Again, if you have no idea what any of those things are, that's absolutely fine. We'll talk about all of them. I do encourage you to write down a guess. Question number two, to conduct a preliminary code evaluation for a proposed project, the architect must possess a certain amount of information about the building. Which of the following are key pieces of information for the initial step of the code evaluation? So it asks you to choose three here. Your options are A, type of occupancy, B, separation from adjacent buildings, C, means of egress, D, 
type of construction, E, required type of fire suppression, or F, fire district location. So take a minute and select three of those. All right, let's move on to question three. And I know I'm going through these relatively fast. Uh, if anybody's wanting me to slow down, just send me a message in the chat and we can go a little bit slower. So question three, what is typically the maximum height building that can utilize an upfeed water system? So your options for the answers are A, a 20 to 30 foot tall building, B, 30 to 40 feet, C, 50 to 60 feet, or D, 70 to 80 feet? All right, and on to question four. In what type of building is 120 over 208 three-phase power appropriate? A, an industrial building, B, a small commercial building, C, a residential building, or D, a large commercial building? All right, moving on to question five. Question five requires a little bit of sketching, or at least in my opinion, that's the easiest way to answer it. So we're gonna leave uh, about two minutes for this one. So the question says, the floor area ratio for a suburban property is 2.0. The lot is 50 feet wide, parallel to the street, and 100 feet deep, measured perpendicular from the street. The required front setback is 10 feet, and the back and side setbacks are 5 feet. Which of the following configurations can be constructed? A two-story building that is 50 feet wide by 100 feet deep. A three-story building that is 40 feet wide by 80 feet deep a three-story building that is 40 feet wide by 85 feet deep, or a four-story building that is 40 feet wide by 65 feet deep. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you guys two minutes to answer this one. Um, by my clock here, we'll switch to the next question at 12.10. I am doing these quick on purpose to put a little pressure on you. This is how the ARE should feel, that you should be able to answer these questions quickly and move through them. All right, we're at 1210. So if you don't have an answer yet, pick one of these as your best guess, and we'll move on to question six. So question six, absolute title to a portion of a structure is known as A, fee simple ownership, B, condominium ownership, C, a leasehold ownership, or D, cooperative ownership. So go ahead and uh, select one of those. And we'll move on to question seven. 
which of the following cost opinions should include the highest contingency allowance? So our options are A, a cost opinion prepared just before the drawings are sent to contractors for bids on a small veterinary clinic. B, a cost opinion prepared at the conclusion of the design development phase for an addition to a building designed by the architect two years ago. C, a cost opinion prepared at the conclusion of the schematic design phase for converting an old warehouse into artist studios and loft apartments. Or D, a cost opinion prepared during the programming phase for a new elementary school. All right, so take a couple seconds to consider those answers. Let's move on to question eight. So question number eight, which of the following factors increases a building's efficiency? Our answers are A, a central mechanical plant, B, small rooms, C, a single story building, or D, many offices requiring windows. So think about the ramifications of each of those answers and what they mean to the shape of the building. Make a guess and we're gonna move on to question number nine. Number nine, an architect is preparing a cost evaluation for a project during the programming stage. The opinion is based upon a previous similar project. Which of the following is a known factor that will add costs to the project? A, a contingency, B, a premium, C, an additive alternate, or D, an upcharge. All right, so select an answer and we will move on to question 10. Question 10. Which of the following are included in a contractor's project overhead costs? Choose four. So out of the four, or I'm sorry, out of the six answers that we have, select four. And our answers are A, bonds and insurance. B, payroll taxes. C, office rent. D, permits. E, temporary office and sanitary facilities and F, transportation expenses. All right, so make sure you've got four of those answers selected. And we're gonna move on to question number 11. So question 11, a town plans to build a small airport to provide commuter flights to the nearest metropolis. Which public works financing method will be the most appropriate to use to fund the project? A, ad valorem tax. B, a general obligation bond. C, a development impact fee. Or D, a public enterprise revenue bond. All right, so again, make a selection. If you've got no idea what any of those are, just make a guess and we'll review when we get to uh, question 11 in the review portion. And we're gonna go to question 12, which is the final question. An architect receives a soils report indicating the possibility of hydrostatic water problems surrounding a basement foundation, which is actually, a, if we did basements down here in Miami and South Florida, this would be a common problem you'd receive. What construction techniques or materials should the architect consider using? Choose four. So A, a damp proofing membrane. B, geotextiles. C, gravel fill below the floor slab. D, pervious paving around the building. E, positive slope away from the building. Or F, sump pumps.
And I see I've made a spelling error there that should say positive slope away from the building, not form the building. All right, so make your selections. Again, pick four of those answers. And we're gonna move into the review portion. So just for everybody's record there, we spent about 11 minutes doing these questions. We're right at 12.16 right now. We started them around uh, 12.05. So that's a good clip to be moving through the questions. You can take a little bit more time on the ARES. Um, and when you get to questions that require a lot of thinking, like a, a good example for this little review is the question about the zoning setup and the setbacks that's going to require a sketch and some math. Um, the best recommended practice for the ARES is to move through and take all the easy questions that you can very quickly. That way you can get as much done as possible, and then come back and do the questions that you think will take you a longer time. That method is a perfect for everybody. Some people, myself included, I prefer to just work through and hit all the questions and make at least a guess on the first pass through. Um, but those are kind of the, the two big strategies. All right, so we're gonna look at question one. A small one-story building in a temperate climate has been designed with its long side oriented south. If a southern view is not a concern, the best passive solar heating method will be, drum roll please, so the answer here is tram wall. So here's why the other answers are not excellent. A direct gain strategy, a greenhouse strategy, and a convective loop would be less effective, but they would all allow a view. So a tram wall is, let me pull up a sketch pad here. Actually, let me just sketch this directly on the Google analysis, or I'm sorry, the Google presentation, then you guys would all have it when we're done. So if we picture two blocks, this would be a sketch in section, and we have a line between them representing glass. A trauma is when you have a large thermal mass right behind that wall. And then we have sunlight coming in from this angle. Oof, that arrow did not come out well at all. So as the sun comes in through the window, it heats the thermal mass. Air that's at the floor is pulled up as this air is heated and pushed out the top. And you get this loop of heated air that starts to flow through the room. Now, a big downside to the strategy, you've got a big thermal mass right in front of your window. So you don't get any view, you just get to use that window pretty much as a way to let the sun in to heat this thermal mass. So this gets you the most mass getting direct exposure right from the window to the actual trauma. wall. The other strategies that we have available to us, direct gain would be if you didn't have this mass here and you were just letting the sun come in and heat the space by heating the floor. Greenhouse would be if we had the whole thing made in glass, which does get you a lot of sunlight coming into the space, but also means that these walls are less insulated because glass is harder to insulate well than um, something thicker that we can put a large amount of insulation on. A convective loop is similar to a direct gain space, but under the floor, we would have uh, loops of pipe or PEX running back and forth. PEX is just a, a flexible plastic pipe. And those would be picking up the heat and transporting it around the house. So all of those strategies are good strategies, but specifically because the question asks, if view is not a concern. So that's the key phrase in there. Then the best passive solar heating method is the tram wall. 
All right, any questions on that? Um, feel free to type them into the chat window. And we'll move on to question two. So question two does not require any sketching. To conduct a preliminary code evaluation for a proposed project, the architect must possess a certain amount of information about the building. Which of the following are key pieces of information for the initial step of the code evaluation? All right, I see somebody has made a guess of A, B, and D. And I see a question here, trauma walls are very uncommon. Do you know of any good building examples featuring a trauma wall? Uh, off the top of my head, I do not know of any. They are pretty uncommon. Uh, let me step back one second to this sketch. One downside to having, let me step out of presentation mode so I'm not advancing the screen every time I click. One big downside to having a trauma wall um, in any climate that is humid, you tend to develop mold and cleaning issues on this side of the wall. Um, it's picking up a lot of heat, and if you have any humidity dragging under the floor and coming up, you're creating a warm, moist, excuse me, warm, moist environment right between the window and the trauma wall. Uh, I do know that a a double envelope strategy is more common in Europe. That would be it's essentially a type of trauma wall, um, except instead of using a solid thermal mass, you essentially have two envelopes and you just heat the pocket of air that's between them. So the air itself becomes the thermal mass portion of the trauma and circulates around the building and is used to um, help with cooling. All right, so hopefully that gives you an answer. I'll see if I can find a, a good example of a trauma building that we can look at uh, for future exam reviews. So in question two, we've got a guess of A, B, and D. Let's go to the next slide and see. All right, so A, D, and E. So let's look at the Florida building code and we'll see why type of occupancy, type of construction, and required type of fire suppression are the correct choices. So separation from adjacent buildings is going to depend on the type of construction and the occupancy. So if we look into Florida building code and we will go to building. And by the way, if you guys haven't bookmarked the iccsafe.org website for the Florida building codes, it's free access to all the building codes they are online. And if you're ever looking for something in particular, uh, if you hit control F, you can do a quick search here. So if we want to search for separation, I want to make sure that we don't have any spelling errors. We can find the portion of the code that we think this should show up in, and it will start flagging through and finding spaces for us. And I'm not looking in chapter three. I think I want to be in chapter six, types of construction. And we should have the required exterior walls, I'm sorry, fire resistance rating for exterior walls based on fire separation distance. So this table gives you a fire separation distance. It gives you the type of construction you have to use and the occupancy group. So different occupancy groups and different types of construction will affect the separation from adjacent building. So that's why separation from adjacent buildings is not one of the top three answers, although it is a good guess. The required type of fire suppression also, um, this has a stronger effect on the type of construction. So knowing those three things gives you the answer that you need about how that building has to be shaped much faster. For questions like that, where you have to select more than one answer, are partial points awarded or do you need to get all the correct answers to get the point? Off the top of my head, I don't know the answer for that one. Sarah, any chance you know that about the ARES, if they give partial points for no, uh, I, I don't think we get partial points. We think you need to have all the answers correct. Okay. So means right. of egress is also a good, it's not a bad selection in my opinion, but it does depend on the type of occupancy and that's gonna vary with the, I'm sorry, it's gonna depend on the occupant load and that varies based on the occupancy type. All right. So now let's move on to question number three. 
if I'll make this a little bigger. So question three is a question um, that is less about having any particular knowledge and more about um, remembering these numbers. So this is a memorization question. So the question is, what is typically the maximum height building that can utilize an upfeed water system? The answer is C, a 50 to 60 foot building. So there's a couple of facts that you would have had to have known off the top of your head to have calculated this. So first one is that water mains in a city typically provide pressure between 40 and 80 PSI, which is a big range. Um, a little less than a half pound square inch can lift water about one foot. So in a pipe, if you have 0.433 PSI and that pipe turns upwards one foot, water will come up and just burble out the top of it, but it won't have any additional pressure coming out there. So 40 PSI can lift water in a pipe about 92 feet. Big catch to that, however, plumbing fixtures require between eight and 20 PSI to operate. So you can have 40 PSI push the water up to the top of your 92 foot, excuse me, 92 foot building, but your plumbing fixtures won't be working, your toilets won't fill, your faucets won't run. So if we take away the maximum amount of PSI needed to operate, we'll find that 20 PSI can lift water about 46 feet, and then at least 20 PSI to operate fixtures. So that would be assuming we're on the very low end of the pressure. If we change that to being 60 PSI, um, we'll find that we're gonna get in the range of 50 to 60 foot for the building. So one other consideration that has to be brought in there is that multiple fixtures can be operated at once. And those fixtures are all assigned fixture units for water supply and fixture units for draining. So I've got two links here in our presentation. I'm gonna step out of the presentation for a minute and pop those links open. So two useful websites I'd like to share with you guys. Um, Engineering Toolbox, which is what we're looking at. And then Arc Toolbox is another. So these have just a whole bunch of handy information on them. If you wanna learn about concrete, they have concrete resources. Um, they also have their own articles on here that give you uh, quick shortcuts. I believe under masonry, they have all of their, like the various brick sizes that you can get to and other stuff. Uh, typical brick bonds, for example, is on there. And that's always, if you're doing a masonry building, this becomes a very useful website. Um, so what I wanted to show you related to the question though, so water service fixture units, and this link was working yesterday. There we go. Drainage fixture units. So for different supply sides, like if we have a bathtub, minimum pipe size to a bathtub is half inch and the water supply fixture units we want to count it for is four. So it doesn't count as one fixture unit, it counts as four because a bathtub understandably uses a lot of water and uses it for a prolonged period of time. It takes you 20 or 30 minutes to fill a bathtub up. So we count that as a four on the fixture unit scale. Um, a bidet, you're only gonna use for a short amount of time and uses a small amount of water. So that counts as a one. If we look at a typical sink or a lavatory sink, those are both ones as well. Hose bibs, which is what you use to fill up your hose on the outside of the house, count as a 2.5. Drinking fountains are only a 0.5. So how much water each of these things use is broken down into this idea of fixture units. That affects how much water they require and how many PSI they're going to require. And that changes how much uh, water pressure you need to serve into the building to make sure that all of your fixtures can run. Um, when they run the calculation for fixture units in plumbing design, they, I think it's 60 or 70% of your fixture units have to be accounted for. So it's not assuming that all of your toilets are going to be flushed at once while your sinks are open. That obviously is statistically unlikely to happen. Um, but that's all part of plumbing design. It's stuff that you would have to keep in mind and it's stuff that would affect this calculation. Um, if you do 40 PSI, if you assume that you have 60 PSI at the street, then you'd have 40 PSI to lift the water, which would mean a 92 foot building would work. But then we're not taking into account how many um, 
fixture units are required and how much additional PSI we need to operate those things. So I would encourage you, while this calculation is good, and I think it's good to know and understand how high water can be lifted, and 0.433 PSI is useful as a, a figure to keep in your head, don't try to calculate this one out. Just memorize that a 50 to 60 foot building can use the water main directly off the street. Anything higher than that is likely going to need a pump station or something to lift the water higher. Okay, any questions on that one? Okay, we're going to step to the next question. All right, so question four. In what type of building is 120 over 208 three phase power appropriate? And our options were industrial, small commercial, residential, and large commercial. Uh, anybody want to make a guess in the chat? Got one person who says DC. You got to just pick one. A couple people saying C, a couple people saying B. Okay, so the correct answer is B. So good job to the two or three people we see who selected answer B. So this is another one where um, knowing the different power types and knowing what they're used for would help you answer the question more than any amount of logic or guesswork would. Residential power, if you're in your home right now, is 120, volt, single phase. Um, if you've ever had to unplug and move a dryer, you're going to see that in your dryer um, plug type, it's usually got three prongs to it that kind of form uh, an odd Y shape. So that's using the 240 volt portion of your power. You'll have two power leads coming from your fuse box over to power that dryer. So that's where you get the 240. Almost everything else in your house, uh, if it's plugged into a typical wall outlet, is using 120 volt. Maybe some of your dishwashers would be on 240, but it's very unlikely unless you have an old uh, power hungry dishwasher. Industrial and large commercial are typically 277, 480 volt, three phase power, which is very high powered. That's for you know machines and industrial equipment that need that kind of power. Uh, the reason that we see that power step up is one, it gives you more power available to those machines. Another one is that higher voltage power can distribute over a large distance more effectively. Um, that's one reason that high power lines are high voltage. So the higher the volts, the more um, distance that power can cover without having significant power drop. Higher amperage will travel a shorter distance. All right, so small commercial is the best answer there. Industrial and large commercial, again, would use the 277 power. Residential is smaller at 120 to 240. All right, this is going to be a fun question. So this is very typical for the planning and uh, analysis portion. I'm sorry, programming and analysis. The floor area ratio for a suburban property is 2.0. The lot is 50 feet wide and 100 feet deep. The required front setback is 10 feet, and the back and side setbacks are 5 feet. So which of the following configurations can be constructed? So if I were doing this question on the test, when I read through the question here, before I start looking through the answers, I'm going to say, OK, the lot's 50 feet wide and 100 feet deep. Required front setback is 10. Back and side setbacks are 5. So let's sketch that. Wake up, computer. I was stuck for a second there. I got nervous. Oh, give me one sec. I didn't leave a sketch sheet in between there. All right, so 50 feet by 100, I'm going to assume that my street runs north and south on the left side of my sheet. 
So I don't want to have any fill color to that. I want to make this a little bit more available for you guys to see. So that will be the boundaries of our lot. If we look at the setbacks, we have a 10 foot setback on the front, five foot on either side, and a five foot setback at the rear. So this is the area that we're allowed to build in. The floor area ratio though, always takes into account the whole lot. So if we step back, we see floor area ratio for a suburban property is 2.0. The lot's 50 by 100. So 50 times 100 times two is the total amount of square feet that we can build. I'm gonna pull up the calculator function. 50 times 100 times two, and we get 10,000. I'm sure there's a couple of you sitting there saying, yeah, of course that's 10,000. I can do that math in my head. I sincerely encourage you, um, even if you're confident doing the math in your head, just do a quick check when you're taking the AREs. Um, it's very easy to drop one of those zeros or put it on the wrong side and then spend a frustrating amount of time figuring out which answer doesn't work or does work, only to realize later you made a mental math error. So it's very quick to check those numbers. I always encourage people to do it. So we need to find a building that's 10,000 square feet that doesn't violate our setbacks. If we think about the numbers for the setbacks here, we have 10 feet in front and five feet in back. So that's 15 feet out of our 100 feet. So we only have 85 feet deep to build in. So we can very quickly say, okay, two-story building, 50 wide by 100 feet deep, definitely does not meet the setbacks. A is wrong. 40 by 80, that would fit in the setbacks. 40 by 85, that would fit in the setbacks. 40 feet by 65, that would fit in the setbacks. But we can kick A out right away because it doesn't take any setbacks into account. So the other three, we're gonna have to evaluate what is their total size and does it val or does it uh, break the floor area requirement? So I should have had this page pulled up, but this goes over site area is 50 times 100, which is 5,000. Floor area ratio is two. So building area is site area times your floor area ratio. That's how we got to that 10,000 again. This goes over the setbacks and how you could do them if you didn't want to make that sketch and kind of visualize it. And that gives you your requirements. So the building has to be less than 10,000 square foot total and fit in a 40 foot by 85 foot area. So A doesn't follow the setbacks. B, if we do 40 times 85 times three, it's 200 square feet over. And D, we do 40 times 65 times four, it's 400 square feet over. So it's too large and that's why it's not an appropriate answer. Um, if you're sitting at home and you're thinking, okay, they say a three-story building, but they don't tell you that all three stories are built out completely, or maybe you could have, you know, uh, an open walkout area on that third story to reduce the square footage. You are right, but on the AREs, only take the question, or I'm sorry, only take the information that the question gives you. The question just tells you these are the answers, three stories, four stories, two stories, they don't tell you, think about partial stories. They don't tell you to consider any other uh, strategies where you could maybe reduce that 200 or 400 square foot in the C and the D answers to make them actually work. So we're all designers, we're all architects, we're all trying to think of solutions to problems constantly. On the AREs, you have to kind of push that part of your brain to the back a little bit and make sure that you're only considering, okay, Here's the information they gave me. Here's the possible answers that fit that information. Make that choice and then move on to the next question. Don't spend too much time trying to figure out how these answers could have worked. If there's an obvious one, just go with that. All right, so question six. This is a good question. Um, if for no other reason, then again, it's, it's a simple, uh, memorization question. You should know what all of the different ownership styles are that are on the right side of the page. And then the other thing I like about this question is it teaches you to pay attention to what is in the question. So if this said absolute title to a structure is known as, then it would be fee simple ownership. So if anybody had that as their guess, you were very close. Um, but the catch here is that it's absolute title to a portion of a structure. So that 
is condominium ownership. If anybody lives in a condo right now, um, you own pretty much everything from the structure or the paint in on that part of the building. Um, you don't own any of the structure of the building. You don't own the floor below you or above you. You just own the portion that you live in that little box. So when you own portions of structures, that's a condominium ownership. Um, fee simple ownership is when you've got absolute title to a whole property and not just a portion of a structure. Um, if you mortgage a house, even if you've taken a mortgage out, you have fee simple ownership. Uh, leasehold ownership is when you're a lessee, so you may use the property or you may sublease the property, but you don't have absolute title. You don't uh, have the power to do changes to that property or um, significant changes without the owner's permission. So if you're renting an apartment, you're in a leasehold ownership situation. And then a cooperative ownership is the one that's the most complicated to understand. Um, it's where you own a share of a corporation that owns the property. So the stockholder may occupy the property, but it, the whole corporation has to decide if they want to make changes. So this is similar to the idea of condominium ownership where it feels like you own a portion of the property, but you don't own a particular portion, you own a share of the stock in that property. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions on that? I'm gonna give this a quick 10 count to get uh, any questions typed up. All right, so we're moving smoothly here. Let's go to question seven. All right, so in question seven, it says, which of the following cost opinions should include the highest contingency allowance? So when we're looking at contingency allowances, um, a contingency is basically a percentage of what we think the whole project is going to cost, and we carry that as a factor of safety. Um, if I wrote a budget for my home, and I said, I think food's going to cost me $100 a week, and I think rent's going to cost me $100 a week, and I think gas is going to cost me $100 a week, then my total budget per week is going to be $300. And then I would say to myself, okay, but sometimes gas gets more expensive, or sometimes I want to buy extra food and snacks. So I'll build in a contingency of 20%. Now that's a big swing. That means my budget might be $300. It might be $360, or it might be as low as $240. There's essentially a 20% margin of error in there. I'm sorry. A contingency would only be adding the money to it. So it would be between 300 and 360. So I would always have an extra $60 set aside for that week in case things went wrong and I had to spend that extra money. If things don't go wrong, I get to keep my contingency. I could put it back into savings or I could use it to pay down a loan or do anything I want with it. It's not part of the project cost at that point. Um, for the record, in my experience, I've been on one project that got to keep a portion of its contingency in my life. Um, very frequently they get used for unknown conditions, for change orders or for other improvements um, as a project is nearing its completion especially if you work with public entities, if they use all of their contingency, then they're more likely to get a bigger budget on their next building that they request. So they're very frequently, if they get to the end of a project and the contingency is still available, they'll find a way to use it. So now that we have a good idea of what a contingency allowance is, the best place to put it when it comes to the cost opinions or the one that would be the highest when it comes to these cost opinions very much has to do with what phase of the design we're in. So when we are in the programming phase for a new elementary school, this is going to require the highest contingency allowance. We have very little knowledge about the project at this point. We just know what the program is going to be. We don't necessarily know the site. We don't know the type of construction. Um, and those are two huge factors. If we look at the other options available to us, so in option A, um, at the point in time that it describes, the CDs are finished and ready to bid. We should have already prepared a, um, a cost estimate at this point as a responsible architect. So there's minimal unknowns. There's a small amount of uncertainty present. 
we can make our contingency smaller. Um, for answer B, at that point in time, design development is done. CDs might give you new issues that come up. You may find that you made some mistakes or missed something in the code analysis. So there's a small amount of uncertainty present when you're done with DDs, but not much. Uh, for answer C, you've completed schematic design, so there's a medium amount of uncertainty present. You've got a good idea of what you want the building to look like and the overall layout, but you don't have um, some major questions still resolved yet. For answer D, which is the correct answer, only programming is done, so there's a large amount of uncertainty present, and that contingency allowance basically covers for that uncertainty. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions on what a contingency is? All right, great. We are moving through these uh, faster than I'd anticipated, which means at the end we'll have time for some uh, questions from you guys. So if you don't have any questions pulled up, start thinking about what you would like answered at the one o'clock to two o'clock hour. All right, question number eight. Which of the following factors increases a building's efficiency? A, a central mechanical plant. B, small rooms. C, a single story building. Or D, many offices requir requiring windows. So let's get some guesses in the uh, chat there. I didn't leave time for those on the last two questions. So one guess is A. C, A, C. So it looks like we're between A and C for the people who are kind enough to put their guesses out there. And thank you to those people. So the answer is actually C, a single story building. And A is misleading. Here's the reasoning behind it. So the efficiency of a building is the ratio of net area to gross area. So rooms that require windows, which was answer D, those have to be on the perimeter. That can decrease efficiency depending on the shape of the building. If you have a long, thin building, many offices requiring windows is not a problem. Um, if you have a square building, many offices requiring windows is a problem because your building needs to have more and more perimeter to accommodate those extra windows. That is the one that I think uh, is the most misleading out of all four answers. Central mechanical plant is the second closest wrong answer. So, oh, it looks like I didn't actually write in the reasoning for that one. Sorry about that. I have D there and then I have C and D again. So for a central mechanical plant, the reason that this is wrong is that mechanical units can be roof mounted. Um, they don't necessarily need to be centralized. They don't need to be in the, uh, usable net area at all. They can be on the roof, which is not counted in the area of the building, or they can be outdoors. Um, so for that reason, a central mechanical plant included inside of the building is why you don't necessarily increase efficiency by it. The best answer is to have a single story building. The reason for this is that there's no vertical circulation required. So when you have no vertical circulation, um, that's one more item that's not cutting into the ratio of net area to gross area. The reason that many small rooms um, would not be a good answer is that the more small rooms you have, the more circulation area you're going to need to access those small rooms. So the more circulation area you have, that cuts in from your gross area to your net area. Any questions on those? Again, A and D I think are misleading and they're they're kind of red herrings they look like they'd be good answers but c is the better answer from between those all right so let's leave questions 9 10 11 and 12 for the second portion of the hour i'm going to push you guys ahead to a bonus question 13, uh, Sarah and the YAF team were kind enough to do a um, 
take a poll of the group and see what questions you guys wanted answered the most or wanted to see examples of the most. And the highest answer was um, how to accommodate different environmental conditions. So when the, the question is about uh, how do you use a site, what's the best answer? And I can see here, we're gonna go ahead and say that C is not an answer. I've accidentally got it struck out on the question slide there. Um, so this is gonna be our bonus question. So over the next 10 minutes, go ahead and think about this one. Uh, take a little break, get up, walk around, and then we'll come back and I will meet you guys at one o'clock. So I'm gonna go ahead and end our recording here. Um, Sarah, anything else we need to say at the end here? Well, between the two sessions? No, no, take a break, guys, and you know, come back and ready for the, the other half of the course, the other half of the session. Uh, make sure you go into the second Google meeting when you do that. So we're in the first link that was sent out. Make sure you click on the second link for the next one. All I'm right, going everybody. To paste the link here just in case. Before everybody logs off.